For centuries, people have thought that the Greek underworld, Hades, was just a flight of fancy or a myth. But I'm convinced that such a place existed because you see, I've been there. It took me 20 years, but now I'm going to take you there. The underworld was where people went when they died, but it was also said to hold the keys to the future. Ancient literature tells us that living people visited the dead to ask them what the future held in store. They went down through an opening in the earth to consult what was called the Oracle of the Dead. It does sound like the fantasy of a storyteller, but this site in Italy has convinced me otherwise. It's a terrifying network of tunnels designed, I'm sure, to deceive visitors and make them believe they were actually going down into hell. In ancient times, people were superstitious, and oracles determined everything. You couldn't make war or peace, go on a journey or get married, without consulting some kind of oracle. And the foolproof way of doing this was to try to establish contact with the spirits of the dead. There were oracles all over the ancient world, but the most extraordinary one, to my mind, has been completely overlooked. It's here, on the west coast of Italy. The Bay of Naples is famous for the volcanic eruption which destroyed Pompeii, but long before the Romans, the Greeks were here, and their religious authorities chose a place northwest of Pompeii to cash in on people's superstitions. Here at Baia, I believe they built the Oracle of the Dead. Beneath these later Roman ruins, the Greeks constructed a virtual hell underground, so convincing that people came here from all over the ancient world to meet their ancestors. It was first located in the 1960s by a retired British engineer, Robert Paget one of the great discoveries of modern archaeology, but completely unrecognized. Paget had read the descriptions of it in classical literature and had searched for it for years. But he'd been ridiculed because most people assumed it was a myth. And then the very day he chose to announce his discovery, President Kennedy was assassinated and Paget was ignored. Ever since, the tunnels have been dismissed by people who've never even ventured inside. But I've been down there with a camera to see for myself the climax of a 20-year quest for the truth. I've come to realize how much the priests of the Greek world played on people's fears. They stopped at nothing to hoodwink those who came to them for help. Before I take you deeper into the mysterious tunnels at Baia, I want to show you other ancient oracles where the elaborate tricks had been developed. And as you'll soon realize, every Greek oracle used some sort of pious fraud. This is Delphi in Greece, founded about 800 BC and presided over by the god Apollo. This was the major oracle center of the ancient world. Behind me is a theater where the great Greek tragedies would have been performed. And down below is the Temple of Apollo. That's where a prophesying priestess known as a Sibyl, acting as the mouthpiece of the god, foretold the future. Kings and politicians, as well as the common people, came enormous distances to ask Apollo to reveal what was going to happen in their lives. They'd be put up near the temple for days and the priests who ran the place extracted news and gossip from them. So Delphi made sure it was better informed than anywhere else in the world and better placed 
to prophesy the future. The wily priests also ran a network of carrier pigeons. So they found out the result of distant battles or political changes weeks before anyone else and could safely announce them as prophecies. Knowledge, they say, is power. And Delphi was in effect the intelligence center of the ancient world, a sort of CIA headquarters. Governments stored their gold here too, the safest place in Greece. The oracle was big business. Cities rose and fell on its advice. And when the Spartans conquered Athens and wanted to raise it to the ground, the Sibyl down here said, no, Apollo says it must be saved. That's the only reason we can still visit the Acropolis in Athens today. People came here in awe and trepidation because they were consulting a god. They had to pay a fee and write down their questions for the Sibyl in advance. Down here is where we believe the Sibyl actually sat. Now, what did she do here, and why was she underneath the temple like this? Two geological fault lines cross just here, huge geological fault lines, and the cracked limestone bed on which this temple rests contained petrochemicals which were released by these fault lines, including the intoxicating gas ethylene, which was used as an anesthetic until the 1960s. It would have made the Sibyl enter into a state of trance where she could utter her prophecies. It was up to the priests to interpret what she said and make sure she was never wrong. For instance, King Croesus asked her advice on invading Persia. She replied, if you cross into Persia, a great empire will fall. He invaded and was defeated. Ah, said the priests, she never said which empire, the Persians or yours. The name of the Sibyl comes from the Aeolic dialect and it means full of God. It's very similar to the word enthusiasm, which comes also from Greek, and theos, which means the God within you. So both enthusiasm and Sibyl mean the same thing, full of God. But all that divine inspiration needed a little human encouragement. The priests of the temple had an ingenious method for testing the strength of the gas. They would secretly insert a goat beneath the temple, and if it passed out or died, well, they knew it was too strong. It was just like the canary in the coal mine. And so the Sybil would then call off her session for a month. And it was a goat which originally discovered the site where the Temple of Apollo now is. Ancient texts tell the story that a goat herd saw that his goat was behaving strangely and wanted to investigate. He was overcome by the gas. And that was how they discovered that there was this strange vapor coming out of the earth, which they could harness for their prophetic purposes. But the pious fraud of the oracles began centuries before the classical site of Delphi was ever built. We're eight miles further up Mount Parnassus from the Delphi that we know today. But what most people don't realize is that there was an earlier Delphi. In fact, 1,500 years earlier. It was called Lucarea, which means wolf howling city. And it was right here on this hill There's plenty of evidence that people lived here. The whole hill is littered with fragments of pottery dating from between 1200 and 2000 BC. And there are remnants of prehistoric buildings. The original name of this place was Nape, which is an Indo-European word meaning navel, because this was thought to be the navel of the world, the geographical center of the entire earth. Tourists who visit the classic site of Delphi are shown the Omphalos stone there, signifying that Delphi was the navel of the world. But I believe this was the original one. The point is that Lucarea, just like the Delphi we know, wasn't just a geographical center, but an intelligence center around which the rest of Greece revolved. Because here, too, there was an oracle, perhaps the earliest Greek oracle of all. You need quite a bit of energy to climb up to it, but it's impressive when you get there.
Well, here we are further up Mount Parnassus, and this hill down there is the original settlement of Delphi. The classic site of Delphi is more than eight miles down the mountain that way. And this cave, this, which is called the Carician Cave, is the original oracle of Delphi. When people came here in ancient times for prophecies, they would consult the three white maidens, who were three local virgin girls, who covered themselves all over with white flour to look like ghosts, to resemble the dead. And they would utter prophecies. And if you brought them honey, they would give you true answers. But if you didn't bring them honey, they'd tell you lies. So I, I brought them honey. I don't imagine anybody's done this for two and a half thousand years. And this depression, which is the place where the honey was offered, was cut into this rock probably three and a half thousand years ago. And appropriately enough, it's got an owl pellet beside it, which the owl who lives in this cave regurgitated. He's a big eagle owl, and he shrieks when he gets angry. And this was the great cave of Gaia, the earth goddess. This was her sanctuary, and this was where people came to have the answers to all the questions of what would happen in the future, all the things that perplexed them. Even in those days, the oracle was clever enough to impress its customers by laying on a religious experience. You had to come in person and subject yourself to what the gods had to offer. In ancient times, this was conceived of as a dragon's lair. The monstrous earth serpent, Python, lived here and his mistress was the earth goddess Gaia. You might be invited to come and spend the night here, wrapped in sheepskins, and hope to have a sacred dream in which Gaia herself, or otherwise the spirits of the dead, would come and visit you as phantoms in your dreams. Probably the Sibyl stood somewhere like this, and in the natural amphitheater below, the public would be there to hear the prophecies. Gaia! As the fortune-telling business expanded all over Greece, oracles like this one half an hour south of Delphi developed new techniques for brainwashing their clients. In 150 AD, a Greek travel writer named Pausanias consulted the oracle of Trophonius here and left an eyewitness account. A few days beforehand, you had to stay in a room of isolation where you became more and more suggestible. Then the night before you went into the oracle, you were brought here to this pool. Two boys of the town, who had to be 13 years old, rubbed you down all over with olive oil. Then they helped you to bathe in this pool. And when you came out, you were clothed in a white linen tunic with a red sash and very heavy boots, and you were ready. The next thing that happened is they gave you something to drink. They gave you a cup, which they called the water of forgetfulness, to help you forget everything that happened before your visit. And another thing, which they called the water of memory, to help you remember your vision that you were about to have. What you didn't know was they had doctored both these drinks very heavily with drugs. The potions used plants like henbane, hellebore, thorn apple, belladonna, and opium, all of which are very strong poisons. You had to drink these hallucinatory potions before you were allowed to consult the oracle. Sometimes it killed people. It was certainly dangerous. At one distant oracle, they softened you up even more with seances with the spirits of the dead. Archaeologists today have worked out what went on. We're off the northwest coast of Greece, between Corfu and Paxos, and we're just entering the mouth of the river Acheron, the river of woe. Our destination is the Necromontean, the Greek oracle of the dead and we're arriving, as they did in antiquity, by sea. They came with plenty of money to persuade the priests to hold a seance and summon up the spirits of their ancestors. You didn't actually visit the underworld here. The spirits came to you, but it was spooky all the same. 
The river of woe was a murky, mysterious place as you rode up it. Dank, creepy. It got you in the mood for meeting the ghosts of the departed. I've come to consult the Oracle of the Dead, and I've been led in by some priests. This is probably my bedroom. Upstairs, because there's a second story of timber and brick, there are more bedrooms and a dining room. This is a changing room. Here, I disrobe and I come into here, which is the bathing room for ritual purification. And now, I'm going to do a superstitious thing. I'm going to throw a stone to ward off evil spirits. These stones were found by the excavators in this spot, thrown by people in antiquity for that very purpose. Then I come over here and I wash my hands in holy water to purify them. And now I'm led into the room of preparation. I would probably be isolated in here for about three days, which would make me highly suggestible. It's what we call sensory deprivation today. And then I would be fed lupin seeds during that time to make me hallucinate and have visions. We know that because the excavators have found vats full of them here. Then I would be led into the consultation. And here I have to sacrifice a sheep. Animal bones have been found here by the archaeologists. So here's a pit waiting for me and the blood runs into the earth as it has to do for the dead. I have to remove the liver and place it here for inspection. That's called the science of extispacy, looking for omens. If they're favorable, I can go ahead. I'm now about to enter the labyrinth. Here is an iron door with an arch over it. The iron nails and plates were found by the excavators. So I enter the labyrinth which symbolizes the winding ways of the entrance to Hades. And I come to this little chamber, which perhaps was a place for a small ritual. Then here I have the second iron door waiting for me. I wind along here, and now I come to the third and final iron door where there's a modern replica in place, and I'm ready to enter the central chamber. Before entering, I want to call your attention to these massive walls that surround this place. They're 11 feet thick, and secret passages have been found in them all, through which the priests could circulate without being seen to carry out their tricks. I'm now led into the central chamber, where I am received by the chief priest. And he informs me of what a solemn occasion this is. He invites me to make an offering of milk, a libation, to the deities of the underworld in this very spot. And this is the original bronze cover, and it's very heavy. The penalty for revealing what happened in here was death, but if you dared to talk about it, somebody might slit your throat. That's why we have so few accounts, but we do have one. It's in Herodotus, and he tells the story of what happened in this very chamber about 600 BC. There was a very nasty tyrant of Corinth called Periander, whose hobby was killing the leading citizens. And then he killed his own wife, Melissa. But he did it before he found out where she'd hidden some money. So he sent an emissary here to inquire of her ghost where it was. She appeared and she said, I know where it is, but I'm not telling. I'm cold in this place. I hate the dress he buried me in. I've got a thing to wear. And then she gave a coded message. Tell him that he put his loaf in a cold oven. Periander was pretty terrified when he heard that because he was the only one who knew that he had had sex with her dead body. Well, he then called a big festival at the temple of Hera. He ordered all the women of the town to come in their finest dresses. And as they arrived, one by one, he had them stripped naked. He took all the dresses and threw them to a giant pit that he dug and set them all on fire as an offering to Melissa. Is that enough dresses for you, Melissa? Then he sent the emissary back. And she said, OK, I've got a great wardrobe now. So I'll tell you where the money is.
This amazing place, which we think was built about 700 BC, symbolized the journey to the underworld. But nowhere in Greece could you actually go to the underworld and experience hell for yourself. There was only one place for that. I think it's time we went to Italy. The Roman poet Virgil describes a visit to the underworld in his epic, the Aeneid. After the fall of Troy, his hero Aeneas has sailed to Italy to found Rome. On the way, not far from Naples, he decides to go down to hell to consult the spirit of his dead father. Until now, Virgil's account was seen as a vivid bit of poetic license. But from my own exploration, I believe that Virgil, who lived nearby, had been here before me, tracing Aeneas' journey step by step. First stop, Cuma, home of a prophetic sibyl like the one in Delphi. And it's an exciting moment in the epic when the ships come and beach their sterns, which you could do in those days because uh, ships didn't have rudders. They were steered by steering oars, which were off to the side. This old scrub forest is mentioned by the ancient writers, and he would have made his way through it up to the Acropolis, and then he would have been taken to see the Sibyl. Let me tell you a story about the Sibyl. The god Apollo fell in love with her, but she spurned his advances. She said, no, I have to remain a virgin. So he said, OK, I understand. And just to prove there are no hard feelings, I'd like to give you a divine gift. What would you like? Well, she said, do you see that pile of sand over there in the corner? I'd like to live one year for every grain of sand in that pile. OK, fine. Well, 700 years later, somebody ran into her and said, you're holding up moderately well. She said, no, I'm not. I made a terrible mistake. I forgot to ask for eternal youth to go with the eternal life. Look at me, I can barely stand up, and I've still got 300 years to go. When Virgil wrote about Aeneas coming down this passage to consult the Sibyl, we didn't know until 1932 whether it was fact or fantasy. But then an Italian archaeologist excavated this amazing place, and we know it's true. This strange geometrical shape is called trapezoidal, or you could call it lozenge-shaped. There are lots of these openings to the passage. Virgil describes them quite clearly. There's a huge cave hollowed out from the flank of Kuma's hill. A hundred wide approaches it has, a hundred mouths, from which there issue a hundred voices, the Sibyl's answers. And here we have three bathing pools with steps leading down into them. The Sibyl had to purify herself before she prophesied, so she came and had a bath here. At the end of the passage, we come into the Sibyl's chamber. At this end, visitors would have stood, and outside as well, because this was a public occasion. Here, there was a partition, and behind it, the Sibyl would have made herself ready, and when she was prepared to prophesy, she would come out and enter the prophesying chamber. On either side here are these benches carved out of the stone. This is where supplicants like Aeneas would have sat anxiously, waiting their fate. The Sibyl, meanwhile, came into her prophesying chamber, and there was a raised platform here, and she would have come up onto this platform. There are niches here for lamps on either side, for illumination. On either side here, people would have stood with flaming torches. Also flanking her were ferocious hounds, 
tethered to these three points carved out of the rock. And these three hounds were portrayed as the three-headed hound of hell, Kerberos, on the back of the coins of Kuma. A hare flew wildly about. Her breast was heaving, her fey heart swelled in ecstasy. Larger than life she seemed, more than mortal her utterance. The god was close, and breathing his inspiration through her. Aeneas begs the Sibyl to take him to the underworld, but he can't be half-hearted about it. Hurry up, she tells him. Hurry up and say your prayers, Aeneas, or the spell won't work. And she warns him that some who visit the underworld don't come out alive. The stage is set for the most extraordinary part of Aeneas' quest, and of ours. Aeneas is accompanied by the Sibyl now. She's taking him on a very mysterious sea journey. It has to be by sea because the place he's going to was inaccessible by land due to the dense forests that uh, covered this place in ancient times. He's being taken to the very jaws of hell. I don't suppose there was much small talk on the journey. Aeneas would have been anxious about meeting his father, who'd only recently died, and the perils of the underworld would have preyed on his mind. From Kuma, they sailed round the headland and entered the harbor of Baia. But in Aeneas's day, before the Romans cut down all the trees to make ships, the surrounding hills and shore were covered in gigantic oak trees, which were hundreds of years old, hanging down gloomily over the water's edge. In those days, the volcanic activity in this region, not far from Mount Vesuvius, was much more intense, so that the whole place was shrouded in mist and sulfurous fumes and gave a forbidding and terrifying impression, a true realm of the dead. In ancient times, when people were confronted by a live volcano like this one near Baia, they naturally assumed that the netherworld gods down below were up to something. It smells sickly sweet of sulfur here, as if I were surrounded by a million rotten eggs, all covered in sugar. Fumes of sulfur were used in the ancient oracle centers for purification purposes. But they also came in handy for the softening up process, to unnerve you for your descent into hell. And even the fearless hero Aeneas was terrified by the time he got there. At last, we are near the end of our quest, here at Baia, on the west coast of Italy. In Roman times, this was really the Biarritz, or the Monte Carlo of the ancient world. And a chief attraction was this place, the amazing Baths of Mercury. In the pool beneath this dome, the Emperor Augustus and his friend, the poet Virgil, certainly bathed. But before these Roman baths were built, long before, Baia had a much more sinister significance. In pre-Roman days, the Greeks colonized Baia. What they created here struck the fear of God into all who visited it. At the height of their power, the Romans blocked up large parts of it and sealed it off, so effectively that it has remained hidden for 2,000 years. What's wrong with this picture? No, I don't mean me. This doesn't fit with this. This is Greek and this is Roman. When the Italians excavated this bath area, which had been destroyed by a huge earthquake in 63 AD in the time of Nero, they found that the earthquake had brought down this Roman wall to reveal beneath it these ancient blocks, which we have reasonable grounds to date to about 550 BC. That was long before any Romans came to this area. And that proves that there was a substantial Greek structure on this spot, but down below, is something far more extraordinary.
We're about to enter an enormous complex of tunnels and chambers going hundreds of feet into the solid rock, culminating in a man-made river, the River Styx. This was the Greek Hades, or hell. We're about to enter the Oracle of the Dead. It's my belief that Virgil descended here because he lived nearby. And his hero Aeneas was described as coming down here to the underworld. Many ancient writers described many real and mythical figures coming here. Odysseus of the Odyssey, Orpheus, who lost his wife Eurydice here, Hercules, Theseus, Hannibal and Scipio. Well, well, thousands, probably tens of thousands of mosquitoes and other creepy crawlies, many types of spiders. They, they don't seem to bite. I don't know what's wrong with them. Don't they know a good meal when they see one? We've reached the end of the entrance tunnel, 400 feet in from the cliff face, carved out of the solid rock. And if I look at my compass, I see the entrance tunnel has for its entire length been due west. But now it bends by 20 degrees and descends sharply to the river Styx. But what is this? This looks like a normal wall of a tunnel, but it isn't. It's an artificial partition put there by the Romans, made of cement. Here, the Romans have put large tiles to block off what was an entrance. Um, originally, there was a door instead of the partition that could close off either tunnel. It's what we call the dividing of the ways. This is what we call the chimney. It's made of tufa bricks, and it's one of the openings that leads between the levels. And this is what we call the rise, and it's very slippery. It's a stairway underneath, but you'd never know it with all this rubble. And just here, we have the remains of a doorway, a double doorway, one of the many wooden doors that would have been in here when it was functioning. And now, I've come upstairs to the upper level here. Behind this wall is the inner sanctum where the seances were held. And there are three doors, two of which you can see here, which were bricked up by the Romans and the entire chamber filled with earth and rubble. If you crawl in there, you can see that there are several columns carved out of tufa to hold up the roof of the chamber. And here is the special place described in the Aeneid by Virgil, the niche, where Aeneas has to make an offering of mistletoe, and I've brought about mistletoe to the goddess Persephone, queen of the underworld. Her special name used here was Daira, and so I've honored her because I hope to get out of here in one piece. This tunnel goes around the inner sanctum and goes on for about 200 feet, and by this means they would have come through to the inner sanctum and then gone out the other way. Pretty confusing for them. Unfortunately, the Romans didn't want us to go down here, so where the tunnel descends, it's 
very much blocked, so we can't get down there. Just imagine the sheer effort in digging these tunnels in the first place, in cramped and dangerous conditions. Removing the rock and earth would have been backbreaking. It must have taken dozens of years. This is yet another tunnel in the Oracle Center. It and its partner run parallel to each other for about 150 feet and join up at the far end, just beyond the point of the dividing of the ways. But this one's largely been filled up by the Romans up to their dirty work as usual. And here we have our only graffiti, no later than the Romans, red paint on the wall. This could possibly say Ilias, a name of Troy. This could be a monogram of M-A-R. Or a, an expert has suggested that it's, to him, a well-known esoteric symbol for the name of the goddess Hera, who was the queen of the gods. We don't know. Now down here, and this is a very narrow ledge, are further tunnels. We call them North 120 and South 120 because of the bearing. They run parallel to each other, but North 120 is completely blocked by the Romans, and South 120 is mostly blocked, but you can get along it with a very great difficulty. It's difficult enough to carve one tunnel out of the solid rock, so why build two side by side? My hunch is the parallel corridors were used to disorientate the supplicant. A priest who was behind you, for instance, could secretly overtake and magically appear in front of you. I tried to crawl down South 120 to see how the tunnels interconnected, but I couldn't get far enough. So my rather more wiry director, Alistair Reed, bravely volunteered to take my place. Okay, I'm game for it. Well, you're a courageous man, Ellie. You know what you've got ahead of you, don't you? You've got this narrow bit you have to crawl through, and then it widens out, and there's, for about 30 feet you can crouch, and then you'll come to the bones of a dead hare. And at that point, it narrows to only 18 inches, and then you have to crawl along that with your face in the dirt, and, uh, have your dust mask on, of course. And uh, when you get to the end, I'll be waiting for you on the other side of the partition that the Romans put in, and we can have a little chat. Okay. Oh, wait, we've got one thing. What are we going to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> Off you go. And this is the easy part. See, you can crouch now. Yep. Do you see the dead hair yet? Not, not yet. I've got the dead hair. You found the hair, good. Poor hair. Got trapped in here and couldn't find its way out. I'm in the narrow bit. I see two tunnel entrances. And there seems to be another corridor off to the left, which I'll try and get into. I can hear knocking. Hello, Alistair, can you hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you too. You sound faint, but I can hear you very well. Look for evidence of a level below, a way into the level below where you are now. All I can see is a pile of rubble above another corridor. I've definitely come to the meeting, the meeting of North 120 and South 120. So where does the third corridor go? It goes off 
to the left of South 120, but it seems to be too blocked to be able to get into. It's too much blocked up, is it? Ah, oh. what about this pile of rubble you mentioned? It seems to me as though it's a man-made pile of rocks, like a wall, not a rock fall. The, the roof seems to be quite secure. Keep in your mind the exact shape so you can draw it. Okay, well, you better go back now, Ali. Thanks very much. So the tunnels do interconnect. All part of the Greeks' plan to intimidate you on your journey through the underworld. Mm -hmm. These tunnels were not just an underground maze. They were cleverly designed mm -hmm. to convince the client that this was indeed the underworld. Here's one of over 500 oil lamp niches carved in the walls in order to create the spooky atmosphere when the client came to consult the spirits he would have his way lighted by oil lamps here's another one for instance and at certain points in the oracle they bunch up and become more numerous in order to create a more intense lighting effect mm -hmm. a temple to the underground deities. Someone coming here to consult the spirits of the dead would feel himself in a sacred precinct. Even though the niches are very simple, just hacked into the walls, no great artistry about it. The combined effect of all the lamps, it's absolutely, absolutely wonderful. And this is the particularly echoing corridor where the sound echoes. Perfect place for chanting. Um. Imagine you're coming down to consult the spirits of the dead, and you have this experience, and you're, you're drugged highly suggestible. They may not have had LSD in those days, but they had more potent herbal drugs. Henbane, belladonna, hellebore, substances that are so strong that if taken in excess, they kill you. And some people never returned from the underworld. They were said to be claimed by the underworld. This would be getting you ready for the great journey across the River Styx, which awaits you. The Sybil of Kuma would be ahead of you, dressed in a scarlet cloak. Behind you would be men in terrifying, pointed headgear with eye slits, looking like the Ku Klux Klan. And as you came down here, the Sybil would say to you, if you look to the left, you will see the billowing clouds of smoke rising from Tartarus, and you will hear the cries of anguish and pain, the screams and moans of the suffering dead. And you would hurry past that and go down to the River Styx. This is the bank of the River Styx. It may not look like it goes very far, but it's 150 feet long. We know this because in the 1960s, an American army diver named David Lewis went diving here and he followed the whole length. As he went, he felt the lamp niches, because he couldn't see them, with his fingers all the way along. And about halfway, this river widens into a lake, 30 by 40 foot, which in mythology was called the Lake of Memory. And you were rowed along here in a small coracle by someone who in mythology was called Charon. As you were rowed along here by Charon, you would have heard the terrifying sound of the howling hound of hell, Kerberos, and the hair would have risen on the back of your neck as you realized what lay ahead of you and that you might never return. When you disembarked at the far end of the Styx, you were then taken up another flight of steps and brought into the inner sanctum where the whole seance took place. In Aeneas's case, 
he sees the spirits of the as yet unborn heroes of Rome, from Romulus to the Emperor Augustus, and has an emotional meeting with his own dead father. Oh, let me take your hand and embrace you, father. Let me withdraw not. Even as he spoke, his cheeks grew wet with a flood of tears. Three times he tried to put his arms round his father's neck. Three times the phantom slipped his vain embrace. It was like grasping a wisp of wind or the wings of a fleeting dream. The power of this place is awesome. No wonder the Roman authorities were afraid of it and set out to crush it. The emperor, himself a god, could not tolerate a rival source of authority. We know it was built long before the Romans came here, but we can't yet say when. We know the Greeks harnessed hallucination, superstition, sensory deprivation and exhaustion, everything that the oracles had traditionally used to overcome the rational mind. The prophecy seekers traveled great distances to know their destiny. The deep tunnels of Baia were the culmination of their journey. This was the underworld of their dreams, their nightmares. What we have seen is only the beginning, because underneath the Roman rubble, behind the Roman partitions, are secrets yet to be explored. Perhaps the living quarters of the troglodyte priests and the buried contents of the inner sanctum itself where the seances were held. And I have detected a lower level of tunnels which we haven't penetrated yet. It took me 20 years to get inside this place. With proper excavation, we could reach into its deepest recesses. Only then shall we fully appreciate the surreal fantasy of the Oracle of the Dead.